Welcome. Good evening, everyone. And we'll do a quick sound check, make sure our quality of the sound and projection, everyone can see and hear me. And if that, uh, if I could get a thumbs up, that would be great. Actually, two Y's would be pretty good, too. Oh, Jude and Don. Jude, oh my gosh, you're if this same, hey, Jude, from Ruth. Oh my gosh, Gary. You guys have been with me all day. I hope you had time to rest up. Thanks for joining me. All right, so welcome to our razor sharp market focus for 2020. I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a happy holiday season. This is a time in the markets um, where we get this particular week very interesting. Uh, before we begin, though, and the reason it's interesting, we have a political event going on right now, but it's option expiration. It's what we call quadruple witching week, and it's the week before the Christmas holiday, which on a global scale, these markets pretty much shut down. So it um, it brings a lot of situations for traders and increases, um, as we say, emotional stress. So not only are we kind of stressed out with our own personal lives right now and the hustle and bustle of the holidays and getting ready, but you know we can lose sight of the markets and what, what we're here for. Um, so I wanted to do this presentation tonight for several reasons, as you'll see later, but one of the main reasons was to kind of get everyone an insight as to what we can prepare for in the coming days and weeks ahead. While we have a time to reflect and sit down with family, maybe some of us don't want to be with family and want to go to, to trading, but this is really not the time to be an aggressive trader because we have a, all kinds of different cross currents in the markets. But I'm going to share with you what I think is a better trade situation developing as we enter 2020 in the third decade of this new millennial. Uh, it, it's just amazing how fast time is going by. So with that said, uh, I want to get through our presentation. Please take one quick moment to read this disclosure. Trading is risky and um, stop losses don't limit our uh, normally our losses, and this uh, presentation is for your educational benefit. All right. So back on July 9th, I want to give you a, kind of an idea of the, the markets and where we've come from out of surprise. This was a, I just threw this up here just to share with you folks. Back in July, which just seems like, I mean, flip, just flip the light switch. Doesn't it seem like July was just here, right? And we were all thinking no deal with China and the economy was going in a recession and, and the market had a lot of volatility. And this was right a month before this historic time period where we got, walked into August with like literally 1% gap openings in the S&P's 1% gap lower openings every other day. It was, pretty, it was a pretty uh, amazing period of increased volatility back in the month of, uh, in, in the end of July and into August. But what I put out was a list for stock traders that said, you know what, if you don't want to deal with this type of volatility, these were 12 stocks that I put out for diversification, number one, um, for traders that didn't want to maybe sit back for the next, what I said was um, 18 to 24 month holding period. And this is the kind of market that just all of a sudden, less than six months later, some of these names, Intel, which is probably one of the worst of the whole um, semiconductor space or technology space in that in that area, if you want to say, up 21%. Um, Target was one of our big uh, trades back then before it became popular now. With, uh, these, these prices were as of um, the 17th, by the way, December. So we didn't add everything up uh, today. So um, some are a little better, but you can see cumulative these aren't some bad returns. Uh, Target up 46%. Um, we have uh, GE was still a dog of a stock up 6%. Uh, Delta Airlines, that's the biggest dog on the books here next to uh, General Mills, which changed today because of earnings and it, it popped up. But all of these percent changes that you see here on stocks that we picked do not reflect the dividend yield that these companies will be paying out or for the, next, the last two quarters that they've been in this, uh, these trades. So how did we get into these particular trades and give uh, insights to these types of moves? Well, we used some of my methodology and technological um, computer scans, so to say, and, and a lot of them had to do with 
our high and uh, closed doji pattern along with the relative strength. And with that said, I wanted to do today's presentation a 30 minute fast paced, get right into it. And based on the same type of analysis, share with you guys what I'm looking for, what we're currently doing right now as we get into the new year of 2020. So you'll also notice, by the way, that most of the slides are blue. And the reason is a good little trivia. Uh, I'll give you another fun filled little fact here. The um, color theme for 2020 is blue. So there you have it. So if you're, if you're, um, going to be the in color, so to speak. I'm not sure if that's really going to be effective, but you'll notice there will be uh, probably in the spring, uh, a lot of clothes, shoes, everything's going to be kind of blue. So blue suede shoes are back in, guys. Get those blue sh suede shoes out it's for the holidays. Um, any event, the um, what I'm looking at is a lot of different stocks that are near not just 52 week highs, but I'm looking for a pullback and top trades for January, which for as a disclosure, we just put on in our own trading community a um a bear put spread which is a a 10 strike wide we we bought the 155 strike and sold the 145 against it uh in microsoft but i'm looking for a dip in microsoft in january back to around 145 uh netflix the other uh disclosure we're already in this trade but netflix i'm looking for a pop-up to around 370. um i don't uh, the same type of uh, pattern existed when we were bullish at the lows back with Tesla. And I know some of you guys have been in the trading community or been in our trade and like trading room. Um, it was funny because we got into a trade in Tesla and like the next day someone came out and downgraded it like right on the lows. Um, and, and our work suggested it was going up. And again, well, here it, Tesla is making a new all time high in that stock today. So I have the same type of pattern uh, that that is showing up in Netflix, not a price pattern, but a, a relative strength and volume pattern. So I just wanted everyone to understand where that came, came from. Utilities, last year, utilities was the all rave. And the reason people were in on utilities was because we were expecting a recession. We were expecting uh, that the people thought that uh, these tariffs imposed on China was gonna be bad. Uh, remember, everyone really was, was you know downplaying our economic uh, cycle. And one of the things that we focused on for our trading room is as go Apple, so goes the economy is one of my old sayings. And the other was a stock called Illinois Toolworks. And the symbol is ITW. And I've been saying this for years. If Illinois Toolworks is doing good, it's really hard to imagine how we're looking for a recession. So anyway, real estate investment trust, um, higher dividend yielding stocks, people were fund managers and, and the the wealth industry, the wealth management industry, all kind of flooded into that safety type of trade, right? So I think that trade is being, it's starting to get unwound right now. You can see that from our, our indicators. And I think utilities is gonna be a big short or a big, they're gonna release some of the hot air kind of speak out of that. And we're long the gold miners right now. Well, we're just scaling into a position right now. So we've, gotten into about a third of a position. We're gonna scale into GDX. We're going with the junior miners when the symbol there is GDXJ. And why am I doing that? If gold remains between even 1450 up to testing that 1550 in the first quarter of 2020, gold miners should outperform. Seasonally speaking, gold tends to rise between now and, and around the first week of March. So you got a lot of things going on with gold. Uh, it's not just jewelry demand, possibly from the holidays. You got this little event called, believe it or not, it's right around the corner. It's, it sounds ridiculous to even say it, but it's called Valentine's Day, friends. And so anyway, gold has a, a tendency to rise, and I think the miners will do well. I also like uh, basic material, not just copper with Freeport MacMoran, but I think that we are going to see with the Federal Reserve, and I'll share some slides with you in just a second that may help explain what's going on with these why I'm picking these these particular moves, but I'm looking for a resurgent in uh, capital going into the commodity space. So instead of being just outright long gold, I want to be with exposure to the miners who should make money on stability in gold prices, especially even if gold moves up or stays the same. 
We are currently long Energy XOP. If many of you have followed my YouTube videos, and if you're not familiar with what or where you can have access to these, I do free videos probably once, twice, maybe on and off during the week, just to give an update of what our positions are. And I tweet some of these links out to people, but uh, on my, our Twitter account. We were focused on getting into the energy space about a week and a half ago. So I've been telling people to have exposure to energy. We currently are pretty long XOP. We're long options. We're long uh, varying strike prices from 22 up to 24 for the March expiration. We're also uh, long the actual ETF XOP, which is the oil and gas exploration. And I'm going to, I think this will, this next few minutes that we go through these few slides, we'll shed some light on some pretty decent ways of, of analyzing a market and why we're looking at getting into uh, and, and maybe continuing with this trade in energy. And then finally, there is no doubt about it. I'm looking for a, a, a correction, a market correction in the S&P 500. So again, if you look at this screen, this is from Genesis Financial. And what you have on this screen is just a regular bar chart. I know instead of candles, it's a bar chart, but I wanted to put more data and, and get at least squinch more information. And this chart goes all the way back. It's a two year window look back. It, it goes, as you can see, all the way to November of 17. So what I'm saying is, while I think most of us think that this market uh, may have been a short earlier, we've been on the long side of this market for quite some time. and the, the two things that we normally see that when we get a pullback in the market is number one, the we can't really rely on seasonality. But this year, this October seasonality really kicked into high gear. Um, more importantly, if you if you think about it, we do get a seasonal downturn. And I think this year, because and I don't know where we're going to end the next two weeks. This little leg move up here is pretty extreme. The year-to-date gain is unbelievable. I mean, we're about, what, 28% uh, year-to-date gain in the S&P 500. So what I'm looking for is a condition and the characteristics of a correction and a setup. Now, if you notice here, right about after the first week or so of January, we get what's called the little January break. And that seasonality trend kind of helps give us that sign of the clue. And what does that mean? Well, large cap or a lot of different stocks that had big aggressive moves to the upside, anyone that had, had been on the trend of those stocks, who wants to take a, a, a complete profit on one of those to have, have to write a check to Uncle Sam April 20th? So what people do is they defer out into the month of January. So you generally see a little bit of a, after a first couple of days of excitement in the market, sometimes pension fund money comes in, new money, fresh money comes into the market. After that, we get this little January sell-off, typical January sell-off. It can come anywhere from the second week of the month to the end of the month. So the timing there is a little bit different on average, but so that's why I want you to look at the characteristics and, and listen carefully to what I'm saying, because this is what I will be watchful for. I'm not just looking at seasonal tendencies of the market. I'm going to teach you what you should be watchful for of uh, when the market's going to generate a little correction. And the next, the next question is, how big of a correction can we look for? So if prices stay right around this 319, 320 level in the spiders for the rest of the year, Maybe we, with tomorrow, um, remember, Thursday, the options expire, number one. Friday, the special opening, option expiration's out of the way. Monday, kind of uh, people come to, to work looking, you know, last minute pats on the back, Merry Christmases. Tuesday, Christmas Eve, boy, uh, good luck. Wednesday, forget about it. Thursday, Friday, it's celebratory and on a global scale. This is a very probably the most solemn holiday, holy holiday in the globe. So Christians all over the world will not really foreign currency trading, uh, European banks. I mean, Boxing Day is an extra day off in the UK. So the list goes on and on. Christmas is going to virtually shut things down. What I want you to focus in on 2020, if we get a correction, we are going to look at a couple conditions. First off, 
down here, this is a 10 day average true range. Most platforms you can get average true range. Now, typically, when we talk about this in our live trading room, consistently, especially in building our algo trading automated systems, only the S&Ps, generally ATR is associated with the rise in average true range or volatility or expansion of range is associated with declines in stocks. And that's probably one of the only market that we look for that. Generally, when a market trends up, it's under a lower condition of volatility, all right? So the first thing that we're gonna watch for is if we start to see an increase in the ATR increasing. So that's why I say, look for an uptick in ATR. Next, you're also gonna wanna watch for a weekly PPS sell signal. Um, I mean, you may wanna look at it and shorten this down to a daily sell signal. And if we get a daily close underneath weekly pivot, that's another really important tell that the market's turning around. But what I'm telling you to watch for, for a more prolonged couple week, three, four week sell-off, watch for weekly PPS sell signal. And if the close of that weekly sell signal is below the pivot, that's gonna develop into what I'm looking for, maybe a four to 8% pullback. Why four to 8%? All right, so first off, I'm using my person's pivot calculations. If we fall all the way back to, and again, you'll notice that this is already giving you the forward projection of person's pivots, all things remaining equal for the month of January. What do I mean? If we assume that the low of the month of December is in, if we assume the high is right here, and we assume we close here, then we're artificially anticipating the calculations are sharing with us the uh, Pivot resistance is going to be, wow, 343, but pivot support 296. So basically, friends, what I'm looking at is if we are going to correct, a 4% correction will get us right down to the pivot point, and 8%, if we close even below that, gets us right back to 296, and odds are that will present a really good buying opportunity. So A, we want to look for an uptick in ATR to help confirm. We're in a seasonal time frame where you do get some end uh, beginning of the year profit taking, tax deferment selling, so to speak. And then finally, look for the PPS signal and watch to make sure that if we get a close below the pivot, that's what you want to look for. Because if you're in a seasonal time frame of declines, ATR expands and you close below pivot, it's going to be a tough time. For the bulls and that's when we're going to time and not just time but also use confirmation i hope this was a, a a game plan for you to watch since i don't have a crystal ball i can't tell you what day what hour what second the sell-off is going to come but i can tell you what the conditions are in which to watch for so now that you can kind of create these types of ideas or uh, setups on your own computer now lastly what you can't see because it's hidden by this powerpoint slide is this is the McClellan oscillator. And the irony is that as we saw a rise into the market uh, last year, we, we started to see a decline building in the McClellan oscillator. And you know, what's really spooky is we have a longer term duration decline building in the McClellan oscillator, which means that the market internal uh, the market internals, even though the breadth of the market is strong, the market internals is starting to weaken. So granted, the breadth of the market is strong because it's going up, but relative to old highs, the McClellan oscillator is forming a divergence. So when this thing generates a sell signal, it's not going to be buy the first dip type of situation. It's going to be, my guess, somewhere between that 4 and 8% type of correction it's not gonna be a 1% pullback. It's gonna be a little bit deeper. So you're gonna to wanna to understand that because that's the condition in which we're getting set up right now. Is everyone good so far? Because I did say fast paced and I wanted to go through A, what we're looking at, what we're currently in, and what we're looking for going into next month. All right? All right, great. Thanks, Jay. All right, so here's the business cycle. This is an old slide of work that I produced back in a book called Forex Conquered in 2006, gang. But this is the cookie cutter type of 
uh, idea of what we look for in a business cycle. Now, what's really interesting, and I want you to focus on this real uh, briefly so we can move on and make sure that this becomes and remains a fast-paced event. When, when investors and in the economy see the perhaps not maybe a total recession, but a slowdown in economic growth or an early contraction, uh, people flood into defensive stuff like consumer staples and aha, uh -huh, utilities, right? And then as we come out of recession and into early expansion technology, interesting, right? Because technology has gone straight through the roof with looking at semiconductors are up now. Uh, we have uh, hardware, the XCI index is up. And then financials, gee, we've had a recovery in financials. Transportations are doing very well, especially rails and truckers. I mean, FedEx is a different story, but more uh, if you look at the subsectors and look at the, the rails and really look under the devil, it's kind of like in the details, they say. And this is not hard information. This is really easy for all of you to just follow it. We Instead of just looking at a few stocks and listening to headline news, we just look at our own type of analysis. And and if you look at this, you can all look at subsectors. You can look at JETS, J-E-T-S is the ETF on airlines. You can look at how great those are doing. But here's the thing. If everyone in the investment community was posed and, and positioned for a recession and there was no recession, and we're actually in a more moderate to middle of the road uh, of the time scale of an expansion, middle to late expansion, then we're going to be looking at what? Capital goods, basic materials, and energy. Basic materials. Gee, would gold miners go in that category? Yes, they would. So basically, even in this business cycle, anyone with any type of higher education in the investment field they're going to be saying, you know what, scratch my head. It's time to rotate out of this defensive stuff. Everything's back to rosiness. And this is the sector that the big smart money is going to start to follow with. And that's kind of the business plan that we're going to look at. So what I'm looking for in the first quarter 2020, I'm looking for the materials to rise. And that would be uh, the XLB. I'm looking for steel sector stocks. Um, so the SLX is the exchange traded fund on steel. And I'm looking for that to rip up to around 4650. You could also take a look at stocks like US Steel and Zeus, which is Olympia Steel. Z-E-U-S is its symbol. Energy stocks. Well, I'm believing that Occidental Petroleum, OXY, which is at prices not seen since 2006, it hasn't been the trade in the, and it's not following the energy sector. Remember, they borrowed a lot of money from Warren Buffett. They're paying him, I think, an 8% yield on warrants that, and gave him warrants and an 8% um, yield on, on borrowed money that he can convert also to common shares. And that, that didn't bode well with some of the other investors, especially Carl Icahn, um, and he wanted the board fired. That was big news earlier this summer. What does Occidental do? They pump oil out of the ground. And if oil remains firm, and if oil right now at $60 a barrel is not even beginning to be in its seasonally strong period of time, which begins in January, can you imagine where will crude oil be? And if it only stays here at 60, any energy company that can't make a dime and pay dividends and have better earnings with a $60, they're either mismanaged or buffoons. Or maybe there's a strike against people wanting to invest in that. And next year or in two weeks, you should see more money flowing into the energy space. So energy sector, the XOP, that's my number one play. And I think Occidental Petroleum is going to be the big rip uh, to the upside for 2020. The other stock that I'm, I'm already in a position in with our advisory service and our clients is COP, ConocoPhillips. Uh, we did establish on the dip yesterday a little small position in Wayfair. I think home furnishing retailers, and this is an electronic or an online portal uh, furniture supply retailer, Wayfair, W. I like retail apparel rallies. Uh, we're already in a position in Nordstrom's. I think uh, Capri Holdings, which is Michael Kors slash um, Jimmy Choo. 
And then believe it or not, Macy's. Macy's is forming a candlestick pattern, almost equivalent to what we would call a, um, it's a high close doji on a monthly basis. Now with Macy's, we have to wait for the end of the month to see how it closes. If the current month, December, closes greater than the month of December's high, or November, excuse me. If the current month closes greater than last month's high, it's a go, it's a buy. It has, it's already setting up for an upside move into Q1, all right? And I believe that the financials in this environment are gonna continue higher, especially our banks. And one of my big picks is again, Wells Fargo. So these are kind of the, the trade sectors that I'm looking at and the specific names that I think are gonna outperform as we get into 2020. Now, this is a very interesting chart, and I hope you, um, not a lot of people may talk about this. I posted this on, uh, I believe, in a Twitter account several weeks ago. And if you look at this chart, what it is doing is it's a candlestick chart on crude oil. In the lower quadrant is just simply the on-balance volume indicator. You can see that on-balance volume is showing, I mean, it's a little bit of uh, accumulation because the trend of this indicator is pointing up, which is positive but as you look through the chart you have two other lines a blue and a fuchsia magenta one's oih and one's xop now yes they separate from the difference between crude oil that's that's true but what you definitely need to see is this when crude oil goes down both those lines go down when crude goes up both those lines go up. Crude goes down, the lines go down. You could see the very strong, I mean, almost tick for tat, almost every single uptick goes up with the market, down, down, up, 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 up. I mean, this is just back, it's crazy, right? Except for right here. Something happened, friends, this summer. Something happened. There was a decoupling between the investment community not wanting to be a part of the energy, either OIH or XOP, because clearly that trend is down and clearly the trend of crude oil is up. We've never seen that type of decoupling before. One of two things has to happen. Either this is going to crash and burn or these are going to go back up and play catch up. And we're in a position to believe that you're going to see these sectors, the oil energy sectors, go up to catch up with crude oil. Global demand, the deal with China might have been why people refrain from getting in. It's not that this isn't a good market. I think there was a buyer strike of capital not wanting to go into the energy space. And from a seasonal perspective, this is the best time to look at getting into these, these stocks. So um, that's what I'm looking at, especially putting together a business model of where are we in an economic cycle, A, and B, what are the other uh, indicators sharing to me? Why am I looking at it? And then finally, this spread chart, which is pretty amazing when you, you look through the history of crude oil and the, the, how, the, the, how close the oil service sector and how close the XOP trade almost Exactly. Now, this this only goes back. This is a, a a a chart that a weekly chart going all the way back to May of 2015. Uh, the data that goes back even further is very similar in nature. All right. So I just wanted to bring that to you. Now, for 2020, and in the email, I said this would be fast paced, and I would go through what I'm looking for in the markets. And quite frankly, I am looking for still the Russell to outperform relative to mega cap blue chip stocks. So people want exposure with the Russell. Leverage DTF is TNA. I think biopharma is the year that this year, as we, it is an election year, 2020, hello, right? But I think if there's, um, and I'm just saying this out loud, I don't want to be political, but with the uh, Democrat uh, candidates and their quest, and everyone wants healthcare reform, but I, I think that the biotech sector is going through a uh, is going to go through a bigger recovery in 2020, and I think you're going to see a consolidation in the industry, just like we just saw a company. One of our holdings was Bristol Myers, which took over Celgene. So I think you're going to see more takeovers, and and that's going to probably condense, and you're going to see more liftoff in the biopharma. The leverage DTF is Labu. 
I've already talked to you about the energy sector. So COP and Occidental are my two stocks that this point and as time goes on, we may see other opportunities, but those are the two that I'm um, I'm starting to pony up with and I want and, and I have exposure in XOP. Uh, because the European Central Bank, not only are they holding rates steady, but I think that they are starting to unwind their quantitative easing. And we should start to see eventually as global economies start to prove month to month data as their economies stabilize and you get evidence of stabilization, not great excessive growth of GDP, but stabilization. And yes, Brexit might play a part of this. No Brexit, some Brexit. But I think there's so much anticipation of how bad things would be. It's going to be a surprise to the upside. And that's going to help possibly, finally, in this decade, starting in 2020, to start to see yields rise and bond prices fall. So we'll be watchful of that. I think the Fed laid out the groundwork for expansion and inflation. When Jerome Powell just said, we are going to allow uh, uh, this unemployment rate to maybe dip a little bit. We're going to expand those and we're going to let to see if inflation gets above our 2% target rate. And we can let that, that, that um, expand that a little bit. And I think between global central bankers unwinding a decade of quantitative easing, I think with that ex inflation expansion, turn the green light for people to be in gold and gold miners. So that's GDX for the, the miners and GDXJ for the junior miners. And I think that's going to be the trade. And you've never heard me, friends, if you've ever heard me at a any any expo or any online presentation, you have not heard me pound the table saying be long gold. And if we do see a rise in inflation, what would happen to bonds? Bonds typically go down in inflation and gold goes up. So if we get an increase in inflation expectations, and by by all measures, we have just a powder, powder keg event that we're sitting on. I think this is the time to be in on that. And I've not warned anyone about this in a very long time, friends. So do keep that in mind. And if you listen to somebody, listen to what their recent track record, not only their historic track record, but what have you done for me lately? Do you have your finger on the pulse of the market? And I think all of you know, I've, as best as anyone can have, We've been Johnny on the spot with a lot of these markets this year. So I hope you found interest in this and, and at least you can you got insights that you can do now your own due diligence as you get through this holiday season. I also think that economic expansion is going to lead to higher commodity prices. Well, of course, the deal with China. But, you know, there's another little continent called South America and Brazil and Argentina. They also produce a whole lot of agricultural products, including soybeans. It is our winner. It is their, uh, their when it's, when it's kind of like we're, the, the, the winter solstice, the, the winter solstice starts Saturday. The longest day of the year is Saturday, by the way. So anyway, our fall is their spring and they are in, in South America, full force planning season. If South America gets hit with any negative weather patterns that hinders growth and yield reduction in soybeans, watch out. We've got a hell of a, a move coming in soybeans for 2020. It'll be a commodity boom. And that's what I think is really interesting because everything's kind of pointing to a potential upside in, in commodities to begin with. The business cycle, all you need is a couple extra grains of maybe gunpowder to throw on the fire and you're going to see sparkles. And that's where I think it's be time to be focused on that and not maybe just long Apple and, and, and Fang stocks. There's something magical happening in the market air right now. So DBA is an ETF that you guys can focus on, Monsanto and CF for fertilizer, just to keep up with possible demand. So what else is going to have to happen? This is going to be an interesting year for execution. And I believe you're going to have to learn to do more stop in entries and let the market put you into the, the, the market rather than pullback orders, right? Where you place limit orders and wait for the market to come to you. We're going to have to use stop in entry techniques. We're going to also have to do more than ever. You're going to have to wait till the last final minutes. And we've been noticing this in the last quarter. Just like the other day, we had a high closed doji pattern that set up on Netflix, it gapped higher the next day. So you're going to have to go with those stop in and you're going to have to wait and just look at these end of day signals and get insights to 
if there's a buy signal happening as the market's closing, you're going to have to take action on the close. I think using confirmation of my pivots with the last conditional change concept has been brilliant. It continues to work for 2020 in this market environment. And again, I, if we do go into massive trend trade modes, especially in the sectors I've outlined like commodities, you're going to absolutely going to want directional trend option strategies. My favorite, ratio backspread. I've been using that since probably 1986 or a, maybe it was 80. Yeah, it was around early 86. I was introduced to a ratio backspread strategy trading treasury bond options on the Chicago Board of Trade. So uh, unbalanced butterflies is another way in equities to use if we do see a heightened period of volatility. Any dip in the market, you're going to see the VIX fly and it's going to increase vol on a lot of your, your products that you want to trade. So you're going to have to do more option strategies rather than just outright puts and calls and selling premiums. So I want everyone to say that this particular event, I wanted to not only give you what I'm looking for, what I'm anticipating, why I'm looking for those moves in the markets, what's the main catalyst behind it, because I think this is a more, I mean, dynamic situation that's brewing because we get complacent, right? We think we're going to be in the same old rut day in and day out, and all of a sudden, something changes. And something is changing right now, friends. Well, you need to be prepared for it. So I have taught people about on balance volume for years, for decades actually. But I kind of switched and used a different concept of measuring volume in terms of percent changes. And a lot of you guys have seen that. I think that's one of the adjustments to indicators we need to continue to monitor. I think we're going to need to see the momentum of relative strength, not the RSI of overbought, oversold, comparative relative strength. So some of you have access to. Uh, think or swim, you use the PMC indicator. Equity traders, the advanced decline has been instrumental to our uh, prognostication and, and correctly advocating for a bullish market condition. You're going to continue to need to use the advanced decline studies, just like either the McClellan oscillator or like what we've done in our own trading community with my own indicator and platforms. You're going to have to break down each respective individual stock index like the S&Ps and look at the advanced decline on the S&Ps, the Qs, the Dow, the Russell, because we get into a sector rotational grind and they unload on the utilities. It's going to give a different weight on some of these segments, especially the S&Ps. So it may look under the surface like not all stocks are going up because there's a rotational grind. When they start to unload real estate investment trust stocks, when they start to unload some of these utilities, you know, it's not going to show up as a very strong market. So we're going to have to be able to read through that. Again, one of my favorite trade setups is watching for pivot support or pivot um, support breakdowns, breakouts and break ups. What do I refer to? What I'm referring to is simply this. I think this picture speaks a thousand words. If this is the person's pivots, if we have a market that generates a buy signal after a specific downtrend, Sometimes a lot of people like to sell when a, when a market breaks a pivot support. It's a sucker's trap. I never sell support unless support market moves lower and then the support turns into resistance. That's when I sell resistance, but I never sell resistance on the first breakdown of resistance. What I look for is simply this. Without giving all the family secrets out, it's real simple. Under the conditions of a buy signal, whether it's a high closed OG, whether it's a PPS, once the market trades back and closes back above the actual pivot point, that confirms that the market now has broken out of resistance and is ready to move up. So it's, it's a high probability trade setup. And remember, if the bottom of the trend happened here and you're getting in, just remember this. This is my line. Many of you that have been in the room, it's a great refresher. If that's where the low is and that's the entry, did the you're coming to the trend late. If you're coming to the trend late, I mean, this was obviously a, a major breakout. Um, but if you're coming to the trend late, you can't really expect that type of performance every single trade. Again, it's a high probability, the percent 
that you'll make money on a market having follow through is great, but your profitability is probably going to lower your expectations on this breakout trade because the trend was already in progress. So think of that logic, okay? But I think the point to this slide is simply this. Signals that generate buy signals and break out above the pivot are stronger trend trades and you should see continuation. Now think of it, if this is a five minute chart with a daily pivot, great upside. But if this is a daily chart with weekly pivot, okay, you got a few days upside. If that's a weekly chart with monthly pivot, you got a few week upside. So what I'm telling you about the upside, what works for the goose works for the gander and it works the other way around. So for downside action, in essence, in all my works that you can get through Amazon, um, candlestick and pivot point trading triggers, which the second edition will be out not that that long. I'm actually finally almost finished with this damn darn book. I've been working on the second edition for two years, friends, for those that don't know. This market has not given me any time to write. So that's my that's the real truth of the matter. But one of my, my sayings, friends, is this. The pivot and person's pivots, what makes this such a dynamic tool that people forgot, is it was giving in advance what the market condition is and it would project what the, the support and resistance. So if the market was bullish, it gave a higher projection of green and a higher projection of red, higher high, higher low. But the magic is the actual pivot in very strong bull markets act as support. And if we continue to move up through pivot, when you get a breakdown of the pivot and a sell signal, and that's exactly what I'm warning you, this is the kind of pattern that you'll see for an equity market sell-off. When you get a PPS sell signal and a market closes below the pivot, baby, it's time to unwind the trade and you'll get a mass liquidation. That's the setup. That's what I was describing when I said, here's the conditions you want to look for. And before, typically before the big sell-off comes, you're going to see an expansion in ATR. Because remember the old saying, volatility marks tops and bar bottoms of the market. So remember, markets where the pivots acted as support equals a strong trend. So watch for breakouts and breakdowns for trend reversal trades. And we've had this year nothing but a lot of really strong markets, Adobe, Microsoft, the list goes on and on, right? So I'm looking for a what? Trend reversal for the downside. And when I see the considerations of that, that's when I'm going to act. All right. So I just want everyone to kind of get that concept under their belt. Pivots in markets where pivots act as support, you want to make sure that when it doesn't keep its characteristics in tune, it's changed. So, like for example, uh, pivot act as support, pivot act as support, pivot act as support, pivot. I mean, again, markets that trade above pivot, they get a buy signal, they close greater than pivot, they go up. So the pivot is very important. When you get a market that tells you that, hey, something dramatically is changing here, we have a lower targeting high, and you get a sell off, this is the time that something has changed. There is a monstrous change coming into the marketplace. And that's the type of setup that we're you're going to be want to be watchful for, and you're not going to want to buy the dip. Remember, you're not going to want to buy the dip in a market that acted very strongly when the pivot acted very strongly. When it starts breaking the pivot, it's not strong anymore. Don't buy the dip. This year is going to be dynamic. The market is set up. It's at the highest level ever in the in the history of, of equities. This year, we have obviously a decoupling effect, people scratching their head between energy and crude prices. Never seen that before. Interest rates have never remained near zero with an unemployment rate at historic lows. Never happened. Friends, something's gonna unwind. Don't be caught off guard. Don't be caught off guard. And that's what I'm trying to warn you about. This could be the year on inflation expectations. Some of you, I think that the smart money is going to be positioning and you want to watch for trend flows in volume as well. 
And I think it's going to be a very exciting. It's not going to be a boring year in equities. And I think the indexes are going to see some just like last year. Maybe we go through a month or so of some low implied volatility. But we have an election year. We have an economy that's doing great. We have expansion and global expectations that global economies do well. I think this is going to be your year. Now I'm offering, and I want everyone to, to take a look at the next few slides. Don't bail out. You're going to want to look at this. I'm doing what I think is going to be, and I don't think, I know this is going to be the best presentation I've ever given. And a lot of you guys have been around a long time. You've been on our financial cruises, but I have something very powerful and very special in store for everyone. And I'm excited about this. I really don't get stoked about certain things, but this presentation, this is my coup d'etat for 2020 in the new decade. Definitely, you want to be a part of this. This is going to be a very special event. Two days, I'm going to build strategies using our Algo 17, but we're going to do it and share not just the workspace. We're going to build models in the S&Ps. We're going to do a long only. We're going to do a short only. And what are we going to do? Both reversals. So we're going to walk away with like three different strategies to trade the S&Ps and get signals. Now, here's the dynamic about this. You don't need TradeStation. We're going to use TradeStation in the Algo 17. And what we're going to do is we're going to also have this with the settings available on Thinkorswim for those that just have Thinkorswim. That's going to be the power. We're going to develop strategic trading plans for stocks and for some futures traders. So if you don't trade the SPY, the ETF, you just trade ES, this is going to be right up your alley. We're going to help give techniques to prepare to establish mental fitness, help skills to overcome traders' anxiety. And again, some of the things that many of us have is that block, that fear, that, and, and there are specific exercises, and some of which I practice and teach in all of my events. So in the SPY Algo building trade system, we're together going to build through the optimization, long, short, both strategy, the trade model codes and the settings will be shared with all attendees. So this is going to be a strategy that you're going to see. How do we build the strategy? How do we optimize the strategy? What are the settings? Now, for those clients that have Algo 17, you're going to get just, we're just going to give you the workspace. I mean, you can copy it as we go along, but you're going to get the workspace. What the heck? So we're going to set up a page and we're going to have long, short, both in SPY. Now, for TradeStation users, we're going to show you trade, TradeStation, you're going to get that workspace. Thinkorswim clients, we're going to show you how to set up the page so that you can apply the settings on your Thinkorswim platform. So basically, there's a couple things that we're going to be teaching in this event. Many of you are not familiar with what a compression exit is. Most of you are familiar with last additional change, but we will review everything that we're talking about regarding trailing stop functions so that you can take advantage of this as we go through to find out a when we do get a for example a time to sell short equities we will be able to have what was the signal based on where's the stop loss what's the initial profit target and how do we trail the stop okay and again here is a situation where if you understand a candlestick this was the profit target and the market opened up better than the profit target. So it got out of its scale out and then it trailed the balance and the compression stock took over. So we're going to develop and we're going to optimize and run through building a trading strategy on the S&Ps to prepare for 2020's volatility in the market. So traders come and they go, New traders don't know what they need to improve. They just want to make money. Traders that have been around a, lot, a while go, man, I need to improve on a few things. So in order to know what you need to improve, you got to recognize what's holding you back and what are those thought processes holding you back in the market to keep you from succeeding. By having an optimized report, you know how many, what your expectations are in the same type of event if the market has a same type of event, a sell-off. What's the average holding period the market goes down? What's the average length of time to achieve a specific profit? That's what we need to digest. That's what you need to learn. And that's what we're going to teach you in this two-day event.
Well, let me tell you about this two-day event. Some people say, man, this is going to cost a fortune. Because look at this. We're going to spend day one, three solid hours together, building and uh, using the optimization process to build a long only sh and then a short only. Because why? Most times the stock market and bullish events goes up. But when we enter bearish seasonal tendencies, like maybe at the end of January, February break, and then definitely as we get into May, June time period, you're going to want to turn off your longs when you have an idea that the market's in a bearish mode. You're going to want to turn those longs off and you're going to want to take short only signals. What about normal times? Long and short only. So let it both rip. But you're armed, you're prepared, and you're not reacting to the market conditions you've prepared and anticipated and now you can formulate with confidence a better game plan and that's that's how we get prepared you know it's not that we're lucky we just work hard the harder i work the luckier i get and i think this is interesting because we're going to go through these optimizations and share with you should be we reversing or no what kind of trailing stop and profit risk reward targets should we be using one to one one to five and what's our holding period data? So we're going to build this also with our Thinkorswim trading pages. We're going to help you create that with our PPS indicator. We have to use on balance volume because my volume indicator is not available on, on Thinkorswim. We're going to use and share with you how you can get better information trading stocks and ETFs with the PMC indicator. And a special event where we put together, as we have in our trading room, multiple time frame person pivot overlays so we want to see like a, a situation is the daily pivot above the weekly pivot because that actually helps to illustrate that the intraday is bullish and the daily is bullish supporting a weekly bullish trend right so why would i want to get short if the higher time frame weekly is bullish and the daily is bullish why would i get short so we're going to help set that into motion for you so you understand you can visualize and then you can see what the true condition of the market to make better trade decisions and put more profits in your pocket and be on the right side more times than not that's the key so we're going to define my high probability pivot breakout trades as i shared with you i mean that is a just a dynamic way when we combine that with lcc guys you're in our trading room it's my signature trade that i look for constantly not just for day trading e-mini S&Ps, but even trading stocks like, well, I don't know what, Wayfair, for example. We had that example today, by the way, which was a little pivot, uh, almost a little high closed OG LCC breakout. So I want everyone to know that on day one, all the attendees are going to get the settings and the criterias, but the TradeStation algo clients, you're going to get, you're going to get the workspaces. I'll create them and then we'll send them out to everybody. All right. Day two. Well, it's a week later because these are on Saturday. So that allows you time to say, whoa, John just blew my mind for three hours here. We got this. I got and I can fiddle with my stuff. I can kind of refresh so your, your life isn't consumed by John person. And you're going to have a chance to get together with it and work on it for the week. And then we're going to come back. And in day two, the following Saturday, January 11th, we're going to go through actionable techniques to improve improve your mental fitness ways to reduce and combat your traders anxiety which happens when we're in trades i mean you can't think of not having anxiety i'm anxious over the holidays right now did i buy enough ginger ale who drinks beer do i need coke zero there's diet coke i mean these are stressful situations forget about the trump impeachment thing how much do i have to get is it sprite or is it seven up i mean it's amazing that these are really high stressful times for us life is stressful let's not make trading more stressful than it really has to be so how to reward yourself are you rewarding yourself when you have good trades and how to set your trading environment up for success what does your office look like is it set up to give you a subconscious boost for actionable success subconsciously do you see money signs around your office do you see past winning trades or symbols of Past winning trades around your office, that's a powerful tool that you can all do. And here's the breakdown. It's a $318 fee. That's your tuition. 
And this is going to run until December 31st. After that, it is 895. This is a class that you're getting your strategy, you're getting training, you're getting two weeks, two sessions, and you're getting it before 2020 gets into action. So I'm excited about this. And remember, as well as we've always done in the past, all attendees will have access to the recording. I would strongly recommend everyone sign up for this. This is the real deal. I know there's a lot of choices out there. There's a lot of people with education and great methodologies of trading with 200-day moving averages and 20-day moving averages and things like that. But this is going to really set the mark for your 2020 and my education. So while I think that everyone will benefit from this, only you can decide whether you need it or not. But I would certainly tell you this. I've never disappointed on any program I've ever put together. I've never had anyone complain. Most of my business is word of mouth. I don't do affiliate marketing, as you know that. I don't have all these uh, different things going on on email, but by word of mouth, and you guys know what we put together. Sign up for this. You won't be sorry. That's my word. How do you sign up? Well, you can go to our website, personsplanet.com, and if you type in personsplanet.com, and I'll post it in the room. Click on that link and you'll sign up and you'll have access and we'll get ready for the 2020 Traders Prep class. And I think you're going to be extremely excited that you did this and took advantage of a almost a free gift because you can't buy a trading strategy for $300, let alone training for $300. I said this would be fast paced for the first 30 minutes and I would no nonsense get right into what I'm looking for. Cut to the chase. We did that. And I said I would also tell you about a special situation. And I think this is a very special situation. People ask, why do I even bother doing this? And there's one real simple answer. And you hear me say this in the room. I work hard at this. And the harder I work, you guys help me get things be done better. It's real simple. So by working with you guys, you make me a better trader. So this is good information for me. It's fantastic information for you. It's going to alleviate a lot of your stresses. It's going to reduce the pain and suffering by having an automated system or at least signals that you can rely on that have solid back test studies. And think about what's important about that. You're thinking the market can't go up anymore and you got a system that's long and you just foaming at the mouth to try to short this thing. But you look over and you see your strategy is still long the market. You go, well, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't sell short until the strategy gets out of its long. Because if the, the market's already in a profitable long position and it's long, why would you want to sell short? So whether you're on the, the trade or not, at least using these strategies that we're going to build as an indicator in of itself. How possibly fantastic can that be? You can use the strategy as an indicator. Think of what I just said. Use the strategy as an indicator. If the indicator is long, then why are you short, right? I look forward to having you guys be a part of my event. You're going to be ecstatic you did this. I wish everyone a wonderful holiday. That concludes our session tonight. Thank you for joining me. This will be online, Hassan. This will be online. You'll be checking in just like you are right now. So this is the actual pro trading room. I don't think you see any latency between the time we activate things and go through and the optimization program. So just as we're working together right now, this will be in a train, the same type of training room with a different password, okay? And we will be recording it. So yes, you go, well, I missed what he said. I wanted to review it. Yes, we will have it posted. You will have access to the recording. So everyone will have access to the recording. I don't know why 318. Um, 318, I think, was a symbi symbi symbolic number. 18 is a very powerful number in Judaism. And um, to be honest with you, uh, I, I am, I'm thinking that this 
needs to be a cost that you guys will put a value on and attend and take serious. I mean, this is not a Harvard education price, but this is a PhD at MIT program. And that I promise that I'm not going to be above anyone's head. We will expressly take time to answer your questions. This is a lot of time to spend and we have a lot of material and great strategies to build together. I look forward to having you a part of my trading community. I look forward to having you as one of my students. Thank you all. And seriously, I wish everyone a stress-free, wonderful holiday. And I don't know if someone can help me. Uh, I could use your help. Should I get Sprite or 7-Up? I mean, that's that's the choice I have to get right now. Uh, it, you know, one's on sale and the other, the other isn't. I don't drink either. But I don't think you can mix Seagram 7 and 7s because it was Sprite. I don't know how that works, right? So those are the problems that I have. Chris says 7-Up is the best Christmas commercials. Dustin says go with Sprite. Dustin, I'm not sure if I got to go with you, but I know the wife likes Sprite, so I might have to go with Sprite. But no one mixes Seagram's and Sprite. It's Seagram's and 7 and 7, right? Isn't that what that was? Ruth says Sprite. All right. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. And for all of those in our live trading community, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you for joining me tonight.